Um, hi to everyone. Um, I had the pleasure to, to meet Matt Watkins, uh, an American who happened to travel in Europe when the war against Ukraine started. Uh, he immediately went to the, uh, to the border between Polish and Ukraine and joined uh, the volunteer uh, organization to, to help as much as he can. Uh, I really appreciate his time sharing his experience, what he saw, what he learned and uh, how he felt, uh, how all the situation changed him. Uh, I hope that uh, you will find this, uh, this talk interesting and uh, useful for your understanding of the situation. So Matt, hello and uh, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me with such a short notice. <laughs> good, good morning, Anna. Good to, good to talk with you. Yeah, um, Matt, I, I have millions of questions, uh, but uh, well, I, I, I'm basically, I'm really curious about your experience and what exactly you were doing. And maybe let's start with your background. This is the photo of the train station. And uh, I know that this is the photo taken by you. Um, can you tell more about this photo and about everything that sure. was about it? Yeah, a, a little bit like you. I'm a motorcycler and a, and a traveler, and I happen to be in Eastern Europe uh, uh, traveling uh, by train and bus. Uh, and then when Putin invaded, I was in Skopje, North Macedonia. Uh, and then I, I wanted to volunteer and help out with uh, Ukrainian refugees. Uh, so I reached out to a group called the World uh, uh, Central Kitchen. Uh, most people might know him because of Chef uh, Jose Andres uh, uh, helping out with hurricanes and natural disasters. Uh, and that group uh, actually, by the time I got to, I think, Dubrovnik or uh, uh, Budapest, said, yeah, come on up and help out. And so I took a train up to Krakow or Krakow, I think is closer to the way I say it. And then I took a bus then about four hours uh, east towards the Ukrainian border in Poland and got to a, a community called a Shemeshul, uh, population about 60,000. And that's that. then that was only about 12 kilometers from the uh, actual border crossing where thousands and thousands of refugees are crossing every day. So the, the background I chose is a train station in Shemeshul, and this is the there, there's food, there's resources, and this is where everybody's leaving uh, to go to far or places farther west in Europe. Uh, I believe to countries in particular that have been open to the Ukrainians, uh, including places like Germany and, and, and Denmark and France, Spain, all, all of the, the, the countries of Europe. Uh, I've been very impressed, have been helpful to, to, the, to the people of Ukraine, and particularly the Polish. They just open their borders and, and, and uh, kind of emotional, but the, the, the acts of my kindness I saw by the Polish people for the Ukrainians uh, over the past uh, week have been amazing. Yeah, it's really that, incredible. How's, that, how's yeah. that for a little bit of background, what I've been up to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm really grateful to you for, for your help. And it's it's really, it's so touching to see all the foreigners, you know, coming and helping and countries opening the borders. I'm in touch with my friends who also came across the border and uh, they're really amazed with all the amount of help. So I cannot even express all the amount of gratitude to you all guys. So thank you so much. Well, that's okay. that's okay. And maybe even a little bit more background. I'm, I'm, of course, an American. I live in the Pacific Northwest, and I worked for 30 years at a place that cl uh, was cleaning up nuclear waste. And, and actually, in the 90s, when the, the, the Berlin Wall uh, and the Iron Wall fell, and Ukraine emerged, you know, as a, as a distinct, not Russia thing, uh, we had Ukrainians come to my community uh, because we were worried, the world was worried about what to do with nuclear material. And so we had an exchange of Ukrainians and Americans going back and forth. Uh, and so I got to meet some Ukrainians in the 90s in my community. Uh, so I so I was, uh, let's just say, kind of kind of aware there, were, there was a difference between uh, Ukrainians and the USSR generally. And uh, uh, also have a couple of friends, including a a friend that has married a uh, Ukrainian woman that uh, I think left in about 2008 in the Donetsk region uh, is married to her. So, so the connections have continued, and then, and then just even f more deep in here in the past past week or two under these difficult circumstances. 
Okay, so you met quite a few Ukrainians and especially now spending a few days at the border. So you, you have really a good understanding of how Ukrainians are. And it's one thing when I'm telling that Ukrainians are great and nice because I'm Ukrainian, so I cannot say any, anything different, right? <laughs> But you as a, as a neutral person, as a person from a completely different country, not even from Europe. So tell, tell us, please, tell me, please, how Ukrainians are. What was your first impression? Uh, and and of course there are there are is what been a million and a half or two million people across the border and I've met but a few dozen and all of it but I, I maybe a maybe a story because even before I got to the border I was in uh, Budapest and I was going on the train to Krakow and I'm I ended up being on a train that filled up full of U Ukrainian refugees that were going to other places and so I got to know five or six Ukrainians on that trip in particular and I believe. Uh, uh, several of them were from, or one of them, I believe, was from the Odessa area, was a school teacher. Uh, two of them uh, were also from Odessa, uh, uh, and he, he spoke very good English and actually had been working in Poland as a CNC operator, uh, a ma machinist, and he actually uh, was getting his mother out, and she was not an English speaker, Uh, uh, and and uh, there were also a mother and a daughter and I believe the neighbor girl and they were from just south of Kiev and they were trying to get out to actually meet up with her husband who's in Estonia but to do that it couldn't go through Kiev they actually had to head south to Moldova and then through Hungary then or excuse, Moldova Romania and then Hungary and then Poland Uh, to, to get there. And then the daughter was also actually, I think, stopping in Poland because she's a freshman in college and was going to plan to go to school. So so to be able to, to, to go from Kiev, but south <laughs> around the corner was just amazing. And talking with them, particularly through, through the gentleman who spoke English for the translation, uh, I had a moment where the, uh, the mother You know, here I am going to go help with refugees and feed feed them. I was actually hungry, and she 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 offered me a, a bread and sausage, and I I felt really bad about taking food from you know a, a refugee, uh, but when I did and kind of told them, they started laughing and and said they kind of kind of got that, and 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 the the the, the English speaker said we we Ukrainians have a dark humor, and at the same time. I, the, the humanity just came out to me, and that was a, a, a particularly uh, poignant moment uh, for that trip anyway, uh, uh, that I got a sense of the, the there, there's something about the Ukrainians I still don't understand, but, but, but have, have, have just been tickled to, to learn about them. So maybe, maybe that's one of many stories that I've learned in the past week about the, the, the will of Ukrainians and the, and the humor of Ukrainians. Yeah, I, I'm very proud of them, especially that they really, they're keeping this sense of humor, even in these situations, and they're, they're making even more jokes, and they're hilarious, and sometimes I'm laughing and crying at the same time, you know, because it's just, it's just me, incredible. Me too, I've, I've, I've lost it more times than I can count, but, but, but uh, uh, some of them were tears of joy, and uh, uh, I, I, and You're, you're not asked the question, but one of the observations that I've, I've made about Ukraine is an American, we have, a, we have a democracy that's about 200, 250 years old. And I, and I gotta say, I've been a little bit jaded by the past few years. That some of our, our leadership, without naming them, have kind of flirted with uh, 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 being fascists and authoritarians. And The way I say it is to watch this plucky little 30-year-old democracy of Ukraine demonstrate and lead to the world what democracy is about has actually rejuvenated me as an American. And, and uh, uh, I'm all in. This, what we're in the middle of is the battle of autocracy uh, represented by Putin and his uh, top leadership and oligarchs versus democracy that's prevalent in the world. And, and, and the Ukrainians have, I think, reminded us all about that. And it's important for we all do everything we can to support Ukraine. So you're saying that uh, Ukraine demonstrates a good example for many countries at the moment? 
Yes, I do. Absolutely. Uh, you, you know, you've got a you've got a comedian uh, actor who turned into a leader, and and he's put on a master class of of what uh, 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 I think the highest form of leadership is: trying to add value uh, and, and 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 rally others. And and uh, like like all countries, I'm sure that Ukraine has its challenges. Uh, but the but the best parts of it are showing, and I'm, hopefully the world is taking note. And more importantly, hopefully the world keeps taking note beyond uh, the the news cycle and and that time when they start to worry about gas prices and that sort of thing. That's I think that's going to be one of the next challenges. Is is what's what's the next chapter? All the while you've got folks back in your country uh, doing some pretty phenomenal things, uh, bloodying the nose of the, of the Russian military. Uh, and, and that's a challenge. And I can't even fathom the, the siege that uh, is, is underway in places like Kiev and Kharkiv and Odessa and all those other places. But uh, I'm, I'm sure the, the yellow and blue flags uh, will feature prominently uh, in, their, in, their, in their struggle. Yeah, yeah, let's hope for that. Um, Matthew, you, you stayed at the border how many days? Uh, it was like one, two weeks. Uh, I got an Airbnb for three nights. I had uh, mm -hmm. reserved that in when I was in Dubrovnik or, or Budapest because I, there, the schedule for this uh, volunteer thing only had it out to a certain date. By the time I got there, I wanted it to stay longer, but you can't find a place to stay there. And in fact, I even picked up two strays that were headed to the warehouse that didn't have a place to stay. You know, it's below freezing in this town every night. Uh, I had, they, they slept on my hard floor and they're still there. I think they found a place to stay last night and then they were going to be able to find a place to stay uh, in the coming, uh, coming weeks. And I feel kind of guilty. I, 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 I didn't tough it out and go sleep on a floor uh, mm -hmm. while I was there. But I also know that volunteers are coming and uh, the, the, the Airbnb guy was uh, actively uh, switching out or uh, making an apartment that he had habitable for more people to come stay. So, mm -hmm. so a city of 60,000 was really stressed to be yeah. able to provide spaces for volunteers there was a, uh, a Tesco that they had converted into a transfer center for the Ukrainians. Uh, and that, that place was very serious. It's not a place you took pictures. Uh, and, and they had these different room numbers. And each room represented a different country within Europe that those people would spend a night or maybe two and then hop on either a bus or a train. Or, or I heard that they were sending vans from Western Europe, for, from Germany or from Denmark to pick people up and then take back to that country. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so it, it was very much a congested point and the Polish uh, uh, people were doing the best they could to get people into the larger cities where there are more services for the, for the rush of, of, of the millions of refugees mm -hmm. that are still coming uh, uh, today. So from what I understand, uh, if you want to come to the border to help, to be a volunteer, it's actually it's not that easy because you have to sort out yourself, first of all, where you will stay and how you will actually, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah, what, there, yeah, what there, would you there, recommend to, to people who really, who are eager to, to come and help, who, for whom it's not enough just, you know, to, to, to sit and to, to read the news or, you know, to help somehow from outside? So what is actually the necessity and what are the needs and how people can help those ones who really want to come and help? Yeah, and, and that's a tough one to answer. I, 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 I've got a couple of thoughts that might help a little bit. Uh, having been there and knowing that, that any volunteer is then gonna displace potentially a refugee space, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 one has to do that equation. And one, while, while a person could just show up and find something to do, uh, I, at least at the place I was at and at the border, there, there, was, there were resources. Nobody was hungry. Nobody was not in a warm place to sleep at night. Uh, there were uh, you know, stuffed animals and toys and everything. And, 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 and the, the, the Ukrainians, uh, uh, the basic needs are being met on those borders. 
Uh, but if people have the uh, really want to do a tangible need, I think the the world central uh, world central kitchen. I think I got a where's my sticker? Oh yeah, uh, that that group right mm -hmm. there is the is the is the one. Uh, d at the very least, donate to them. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that group. If you put world world central kit or wcf.org uh that the i i saw and and can provide you some pictures of okay. the warehouse that they were buying food and 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 feeding actually feeding people uh mm -hmm. warm 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 meals at all these locations uh and then also do an investigation at places that might be able to donate things mm -hmm. um i think as time goes forward well, there also will be more refugees in the other countries of Europe and hopefully in Britain and in the United States. So, so back at home, look uh, at where the refugees are coming and, and going to more are going to be coming and help out locally. Um, and, and if you, if you got to go to the border, um, I'm going to leave that to people to, to Google themselves and, and, and uh, it takes a bit of determination to, to, to want to show up and, and, I was actually very fortunate to be able to go to the border uh, and, and see things. And then I've been sharing information with folks like you, you know, be a witness of what's been happening. And I think getting the message out a little, hopefully a little bit more deeply than, you know, might show up on CNN with a shot of a piano or a, a stroller yeah. uh, help, helps fill in the details a bit. Yeah. So what can you tell us that we didn't see in the news from, I mean, from you being a witness, uh, seeing everything with your yeah. own eyes. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think maybe an example. Um, there, there was a gentleman that was a a, a pole, uh, a Polish gentleman that lived there in the town I was. That his job was a was a car car salesman, and he. Uh, I, I, everybody wants to go to the border and see the border. And I did that. But afterwards, instead of taking me back to the warehouse, he said, you know, come with me and, and, and told me about that. And when he showed me that distribution center, that, that Tesco that was converted over, he uh, broke down a little bit too. And, but, and then also told me it's important to remain strong through all of this. And, and uh, the, the, the don't cry in front of the Ukrainians and, and, you know, show them that they're safe. And, and I think that was an important lesson. Uh, and then I also had a, actually I had soup yesterday morning. What, what, you know, I got over the idea that as a volunteer, you're not supposed to stand in the soup line, but I waited until there was nobody in the line for soup. And I got one of the best bowls of soup I had ever had in my life. Uh, and then I went out to a table and I was, standing there and I, I saw a gentleman that didn't speak any English that he had a, uh, um, Madrid rail rugby shirt on and, and, uh, I pointed to it and smiled and that broke the ice. And then it turns out his daughter right next to me was fluent in English, worked in Germany and went back to that border to get, uh, her dad. And, and, um, two things I learned is the connectivity the Ukrainians have. Uh, everybody has a cell phone and everybody knows where everybody else is at. I mean, internet works uh, at those borders. And the only thing is they get a, a SIM card. SIM cards are very important to Ukrainians once they got across the border. And they, they were handing them out for free uh, in Poland to, to be able to have people connected. And the other thing that she, she said to me, I think she relayed a translation and her father uh, said that he, once he was in Poland, he was safe and that the skies were safe. And I kind of thought about that because he was in Kiev, I think, just a few days earlier. And the idea that, that there's, ran, there's random artillery shells and rockets going into town because the Russians aren't targeting just the military. And I, I, I think that might be an example of some of the things that I've, maybe they've touched on the media just a little bit, but it really brought it home to me, the, the, the detail and the, the specifics and, and the sense of dread that maybe he had that he didn't have now that he was across the border into a NATO country, a strong NATO country. Mm -hmm. 
Is that, how's that for an example of, of maybe something a little deeper than the media? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just now that, that there's a lot of information coming from all the sides. And of course, me being a Ukrainian, of course, I know where is the truth, right? And who to believe. But for example, what would you recommend to, to people who are actually outside of the countries which may be affected or which are affected at the moment? How to actually, how to find out, how to, how to differentiate what is true, what is not true, where to go for the information, for the reliable sources of news? Well, and of course, I'm a I'm a kid who grew up in the United States, so you know we're 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 going to have certainly a slant on our, on our media in general. Uh, but I think, as always, World War II, uh, the BBC is probably an incredible news source. I think they've they they've started up uh, a shortwave broadcast again, and it sounds like something you would hear out of a radio from World War II that's being broadcast into into Russia. I think the British. Uh, broadcast corporation would be an excellent uh, 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 neutral source of information. Uh, I also think the Associated Press in the United States, they're the ones who feed a lot of news to other news organizations. Uh, they're, they're, they're ideally not left or right, but, but kind of a, what would you call an old fashioned news organization that wants to uh, actually uh, do, do the truth more than maybe opinion. Uh, it's 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 a lot harder to find objective information in our connected, our connected way. But uh, uh, I think those would be a couple, of two examples for good information sources that are going to be available on websites if you mm-hmm. if you if you just Google Associated Press or BBC. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a few times that it was like in World War Two. Um, do you think that it's already the World War Three? I don't know. Um, well, it's, yeah, it's a strange yeah. question and it, it's just, it's been on my mind, you know, for a long time. Just curious about your opinion. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in this, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this a little bit. So give me, give me a little bit of patience here. And then again, I'm a, an American sure. who America's not been directly involved. And I think there might be a valid argument yeah. Uh, to, to say that maybe we shouldn't be directly involved as a nuclear power, because when nuclear powers start actually battling each other directly, uh, there, there's potential for, for, for some very, very bad things. That said, uh, again, here's a couple examples. I'm trying to, things, things that I've seen. When I was in uh, Krakow, uh, there were, that we know that NATO as an organization that the United States has sent additional troops into there. So there were, I saw two or three squads of U.S. Army walking the streets of Krakow, Poland, including the 82nd Airborne. And these are the most polite 18 and 19 and 20 year old uh, uh, men and and, and women uh, from the United States that were from North Carolina and from Texas. And, and those are examples of, of bolstering the, the, the United States and, and, and other countries in a collective that, that, that's NATO. And then as well, the European Union is a, is a, a collection, you know, the diplomacy is happening there. Uh, we'll see, I guess, how effective rational uh, 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 diplomacy works against a person, Mr. Putin, that may not be a rational uh, a player and is kind of sticking to an ideology that seems to me out of the 1940s or 50s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also know that the United States have put, also put some Patriot defensive batteries in Poland, uh, but those are missiles and we'll see how that, that plays uh, with, with uh, the, the media and the, and the, in, the in, in Russia. Um, I also think the Euro- European Union um, I wonder if they might uh, give provisional status to Ukraine, because I think Ukraine's uh, entry into that might be a little mm-hmm. bit less problematic and easier than the, the, the NATO question. I, I don't know. Is that, a, is, that a, is that a helpful answer, a partial answer, at least to your question? Yeah, your yeah, 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 that's fine. I mean, it, it's really hard to answer this question. It's a, Yeah, it's uh, more about our personal and, and opinions I, and fears, I, maybe, and doubts. <laughs> Yeah, and I say this, and if any, and, and some of your folks watching is, why didn't he say this? And I, I apologize if I'm, no, I'm, no, no. I'm missing some basic thing, but it's, 
it's been a little overwhelming the past week to kind of be at the at the front of it. And sometimes I've missed uh, actually media access. And now that I'm comfortable in a in a room in Vienna, and mm-hmm. and you know thinking about it, I'm going to be I'm going to be thinking about what I saw here for the for for a long time to come. Yeah, I'm sure. I read on your pages that um, since you returned, you changed a lot. Uh, yeah. Do you do you know already what exactly changed? Or um, I assume that yeah, you will contemplate on that a long, long time still. But uh, what is already obvious to you? What things changed inside of you that will never be the same? Well, I think I think it fits in with a larger narrative of uh, I, I, I back home. I was a council member and mayor for 16 years of my of my city, uh, and I had the good fortune of being able to uh, actually I paid off my house and being single with no kids. I instead of instead of waiting until I retire, I decided to take three years off and go world travel, and notwithstanding the, the very first day. When I was in Singapore, uh, they announced COVID. Uh, it made it a little bit more challenging, but but I've I besides the Asia trip, I also got to do Western Europe last year, including walking the Camino de Santiago, and then I started a trip in uh, this trip. I started in Turkey, spending a month there and working through the Balkans, uh, and and this thing happened, and and. So, so I got to be in the right place, kind of the right time to kind of see a, a moment of history. But I'd say that larger perspective of interconnectedness of the world, uh, sometimes I think Americans uh, should travel more. And so I'm trying to, sounds kind of cheesy, but I'm trying to be a better world citizen. So I might be, become a better American citizen. And, uh, and at the same time, you, you, you can relate to this. I, 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 I see a motorcycle go by and I feel like I should be jumping on it to go go see a mountain of, of a country of a place I've been in. But this particular trip, I've been sticking to trains and buses, but mm-hmm. I'm also scouting out places I think I need to return to uh, mm-hmm. in the future and, and, and uh, spend more time in. And there are a lot of places, particularly in Eastern Europe uh, and, and, that I'm, and, and including Ukraine. Ukraine was yeah. on my list of places to see not going to see it right now, but I'm going to go see it when I can and it's, and it's safe again. And hopefully that's sooner than later. Yeah, definitely. Um, I can see now that there's a lot of interest from, um, from the side of foreigners towards Ukraine as a country, as a geographical location, as a beautiful country. And it is really so. And uh, definitely I'm so happy now to realize that actually many, many people will get to know about Ukraine. And uh, yeah, it, it's a horrible situation. But on the other hand, there are some positive things as well. For example, right? I mean, I've been traveling for eight years, right? With my Ukrainian flag, always telling uh, where I'm from. So in some remote places, when people heard that I'm from Ukraine, they were like, uh, where is it? What is Ukraine? <laughs> is it part of Russia or Soviet Union? But now everyone knows what is Ukraine and they're aware of the situation. And that really makes me feel... Um, kind of more comfortable, you know, that now Ukraine has yeah. its its own place uh, in the world. And uh, yeah, that is great. So you're most and, welcome and, to, and, to come back to Ukraine <laughs> again. Yeah. Well, and, and back to those folks on the train, uh, they, they had just gotten out. And I think they were a bit surprised that Ukraine was on the world's consciousness. And I think that made them feel a little better too. And if you don't mind, let's switch this up a little bit. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, if you if you could be in Ukraine right now, back back home, what what would what, what would you want to do, or what 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 what's your your desire to try and help out? What what do you what do you, what's what are your plans, or what do you want to do? Yeah, thanks for the question. And actually, that's the question that I'm asking myself all these days and uh, talking to, to my friends and to other people because I really want to contribute and to help. And but I want to understand where I will be of more help been there or been outside you know like talking to people like you and sharing the information because like you said like to come now to the border and then to do what yeah so i might maybe not uh, help as much as i would being outside um but still it's um it's still all this thoughts you know floating in my mind and actually talking to people like you actually it um it helps me a little bit to get more understanding and uh, more information but i still i haven't decided what i will do uh whether i will continue traveling the thing is um right now i'm in africa right and i arrived one day before the war 
So I arrived on 23rd of February and the war started on 24th. And that was, uh, it's hard to express with words. <laughs> yeah, it was just devastating. Um, and I immediately saw that I had to go back. Um, but then for some reason, I happened to be in Africa. And Africa is quite a difficult continent because they have a lot of ties with Russia, you know, and most of the countries, they try to keep neutral, you know, because there's a lot of political relations with Russia. So I was thinking that maybe kind of my mission, well, it, it sounds too loud, but maybe to raise a little bit of awareness, you know, because uh, people here, they, they feel very distant, you know, from this problem. I mean, this war is somewhere, somewhere on the other part of the world. So they don't actually realize that it might become really global and it can affect everyone, including them. So um, I've been given already a few interviews on the radio and newspaper, and now I'm trying to organize some events for the biking community here in Africa and just uh, for, for ordinary people talking. So I don't know, maybe that- I think that's a good plan. I think you're, Maybe, that's, a, that's a good idea. Yeah, but on the other hand, I still feel this uh, sense of helplessness and sense of that it's not enough, you know, like being there like you and when I see these photos, even to show to the world what is happening, you know, through my eyes, through my stories. Like you said, this is the time to collect stories, you know, and uh, in these days of fake information or false information, stories can be also a very powerful weapon that they have to use, you know. So I, I'm still not sure what I will do seriously. And uh, I hope that the answer will just come into my mind and I will know for sure what is right, what is wrong, because even some parts of the day, I already, I already take a decision that I'm doing this way. And then after a couple of hours, uh, another way of thought comes, you know, comes into my mind. So it's... Uh, it's really difficult to design, and I wish the, there would be someone like I don't know, prophet or oracle, <laughs> who would tell me you have to you have to do this way. But I understand that it's not possible, and it's actually it's all about our decision. And in this situation, actually, there is no right or wrong, and everything that you decide is actually is right if this is the right for you personally. Yes. Um, yes. But I would appreciate your ideas as well, <laughs> even though, um, yeah, it's just our chat and uh, exchange of thoughts. So um, I would appreciate that too. Um, as the person who was there, and uh, that's why I'm very curious about what exactly you have done and how do you see the people from outside, especially Ukrainians who happen to be outside? Yeah, because someone was traveling, someone lived for a few years or someone was married abroad. I mean, every, Ukrainians are everywhere in the world. So how, how can we help uh, and how can we contribute? Is it really crucial to come back to Ukraine or to the border with Ukraine and to help there? Or maybe there's something that can be done outside and it will be more efficient. So what, what are your thoughts? Well, and actually, as you were as you were talking about it, and I think you and I are in a similar place, and and trying to find that magic thing that that, that crystallizes thought. And and I don't I, I don't know if I have an answer. I'm not going to have a good solid answer to that. But I think the next step, or or something we need to think about, is making sure to continue to press this issue, not only sharing stories with our friends and families but expressing to our leaders in our various countries how important this is. And, and it sounds kind of simplistic, but not letting them forget how important it is because we have this attention span, fairly short attention span until the next cute cat video on YouTube. But this is, this is important stuff and, and supporting locally, whether it be, uh, a local local uh, council member or a state representative or a federal congressman or or an email to to the president of your country as an example in, in Americans I think that's what we got to work on in the coming uh, days weeks and months uh, because uh, again an example when I saw the, the this operation the world uh, uh, central kitchen I was in a warehouse that didn't have a, a, a toilet when I first got there and they had installed that that afternoon. Uh, they also didn't have a, a, a cooler 
uh, for their meat. By the time I left, they had a fully functioning walk-in cooler they could drive forklifts into. Uh, and, and they also, they had one cooking pot set up. And then when I left, they had 10 functional cooking pots. So that organization was not only thinking about what happens this week, but I talked with them and they're thinking about what they're going to be doing months from now because this thing is going to continue on. So, uh, and then we got to think about too, what happens when, uh, uh, when, when, when Putin is put back uh, and, and, and uh, there's probably going to be a country that is uh, massively devastated. And so what's going to happen after that? And I, th I think it's important for us to think about the long term too. This is going to be a, a marathon and, and we're just in the first we're in the first lap of a, of a track here. Uh, this is going to, this is going to go on a while. Like it, it was, it was obvious uh, uh, that that was, that this is going to be a long-term thing. Okay. So you're saying that it will take I, a I, while until it's, uh, it's finished, I guess. Yeah. So like many Ukrainians and me, including, we really hope that uh, it will stop soon because it cannot continue like this for months, because I mean, the, the, there will be nothing left in Ukraine with all this, you know, mass destruction that they are causing to our country. So it just, it, it, it has, it has yeah. to be stopped like uh, very soon. Otherwise. <laughs> I, 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 I wish I was, uh, Wish I had an answer to that one too, and 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 I I, I gotta hope uh, that where diplomacy fails, maybe some some hardball tactics by some of the countries, maybe maybe Europe, United States, and others get together, and um, there there might be common next step, and that's not pleasant to think about, uh, but but uh, uh, I, I also know that there. There is a siege going on in Kiev and Kharkiv and the other cities, and and uh, 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 getting supplies to them, uh, humanitarian supplies as, as well as as weapons uh, is is going to be a real challenge in the coming coming weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um... wish I had a way to wrap all this up with a, a pretty bow, but uh, it's not. No. But uh, no, we, I think we got to keep remember the humanity of all of it, and and uh, uh, I, I'm 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 also thinking about the the smiling faces of the folks I've met uh, from from Ukraine, and and uh, they're they're serious and and stoic, but uh, uh, the, the the empathy and the the humanity I saw uh, ran far deeper than 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 the despair I saw. It was, it was, it's been an amazing week and one I'm not going to forget. So they still smile despite everything. Yes. They find the reason yes. to smile. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> Matt, you, you, you've seen that there's a lot of help coming from, from Europe, right? So do you think that this is actually enough or that there could be something more that could be done? Or is it actually that everything that was done to the maximum? Uh, I, the, uh, again, the, 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 making sure that the, the, at least the people that make it to the border. And then I also think, uh, by extension, maybe Lviv, you know, the, the places that are not controlled by the Russians, I think there are res resources there. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 I'm sure that in, in the, uh, in the, the EU is in particular, I mean, they've been releasing extra resources and everything to, to, to do that. And I, 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 I can't speak more deeply on that and I'd only be speculating. I wouldn't wanna uh, offer an opinion that's, I mean, I'm used to having areas of expertise and that's an area I get, I'm, I don't know as much. I just yeah. know that it's, it's, it's weighing heavily on minds of a, of a lot of governments in the world. Well, maybe, maybe there's a pivot here and I think, oh, Sorry oh, to lose that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think there's the, there's the maybe the the the, the discussions about the the 800 pound gorilla to borrow an American term that's in the room, and that's what China is going to do. And I think China is making personally. I think they're making a very uh, deliberate uh, calculation. Maybe it's more of sort of in a in a business perspective. They have not uh, aligned themselves with Russia. But that said, they haven't distanced themselves either. So I think what China does uh, is going to be critically important in this. 
and and start. I think we could all think about what that is. I don't, I don't know what the answer is. You, you don't call up China and say you should do this. Yeah. But uh, 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 an awareness of, of, of them being an important player in the larger world scheme, I think, is probably something we should all think about at least. Uh, maybe that's that's helpful to think about. Okay. Well, let's see what happens. Hopefully, everything will happen for, for our benefit, for the benefit of Ukraine and for our fast victory. Let's hope for that. Um, Matt, what would you like to say to Ukrainians who... Who will listen to you? Who are listening to you? Just uh, I know that not everyone will hear. Just for for those few that will hear I, our conversation, what would you like yeah. to tell them? I I'd love to say the world has your back, and it does right now, and 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 that we gotta we gotta keep having their back, uh, and 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 keep having discussions like you and I are having. Uh, having that discussion is part of a democratic process, and and if there's anybody who sees this, uh, know that they're 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 being thought about by every single body on this in this whole entire planet right now. Knows about Ukraine and and uh, uh, can kind of seem distant if they got a rocket coming through their window in Kiev, uh, but but uh, we're we're working through it and trying we're trying. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So what are your next plans? What, 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 what do you think to do with your, I don't know, about your life, your work, yeah. your free time? <laughs> Any thoughts well, about I it? Well, I, I do have an, a, a meeting with some friends that I made when I walked the Camino de Santiago uh, last year. I'm meeting up with them in uh, Malaga, Spain, here, mm-hmm. in a, here in about a week. So I'm going to be working my way over there by train and seeing a couple countries I've not been to. Um, larger term though, I'll be heading back home in May and I'm thinking about what I'm going to do in the next chapter in my life. Uh, I decided, uh, I'm not going to go back and work in a cubicle and, 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 and just be for the work for the man and try and live life on those two week vacations that Americans, uh, do. Uh, I'm thinking about some way to serve, uh, my community, uh, but also thinking about how to serve in the, the larger world. And I, I, I've left uh, the, the, the World uh, Central Kitchen, letting them know that I'm still interested in helping them out. And, and mm-hmm. so, so I can imagine being activated and help out with them again. Um, and uh, uh, I, I also got to keep telling the story of, of what I saw. I, I bore witness to something that was very important to share with, with people. And uh, uh, I'm going to keep telling that story. And, and as soon as I can, I want to go visit Ukraine. I want to, hopefully we, you and I can be there sometime and we can, I can rent a motorcycle and you can show me around your wonderful country. By that would be great. Motorcycle. That would be awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm very thankful to, for your contribution, for your input. And um, we really appreciate all Ukrainians to, to everyone like you coming from overseas, from other countries to, to help us out. And maybe I, I'm sure that maybe not everyone can express it uh, because of language barrier and uh, emotions and panic, but I'm sure that everyone feels that in, in their hearts. So uh, thank you very much for that. And, um, and God and bless you, you and everything. We've been Facebook friends. Uh, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to share my uh, uh, a profile link on, your, on this thing, uh, I have made some of them public, especially the stuff. Uh, so if people want to read some of the things and see some of the pictures I've seen, of course, uh, that'll be uh, you'll be you'll be link this on that, and we'll we'll so other people can see it as well. Yeah, definitely. I will publish our interview on my YouTube channel, and then I will link you and um, invite uh, friends to to read your comments, your your posts about your experience in Ukraine and the rest. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Good nice Thank to you. meet you, Arna. Thank you so much, Matt, and good luck to you. <laughs>